All right, cool. So this is going to be note 14 from CS70. This one is all about conditional probability, independence, and the combination of events. So briefly, what is independence? Easi easiest example to think of um, would be coin tosses. So, you know, we flip one coin, um, there's a 50% chance you land on heads. You flip another coin, or you flip the same coin a second time, still 50% chance that you land on heads. Um, dealing cards is dependent because as soon as you deal one card, you know, that card is out of the deck, we don't replace it. And so the second card is sort of dependent on what you drew for the first card. Right, so straightforward enough, I think. So conditional probability. So basically what it is, is the probability of A, event A given event B. So we can start off by looking at a case where we have four balls and three bins. And event A is the chance of the first bin being empty. So basically what that is, is um, the chance that all four balls must reside in the last two bins. So if we confine ourselves to just using those bins, um, you know, we can pick two of those bins out of the three. So we have a two out of three chance of each time when we throw a ball to land in those two bins. So we just raise this to the fourth power and we get 16 over 81. Event B is the chance that the second bin is open. And the way that we notate the probability of event A given event B is like this. So let's look at this notation right here. So the probability that event A occurred given that event, event B already happened is going to be the sum of all of the sample points in A and B. Um, the sum of all the, basically given B, it's gonna be the sum of all the sample points in A. And the way we're going to represent that um, is by basically taking each sample point and dividing it, each sample point's probability and dividing it by the probability of B and then like summing all of those up. And we're going to get this equation right here, which is basically going to say the probability of A and B, and we're going to divide out the probability of B. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So if we think of a, a Venn diagram of say this is A and then like this is B, so there's like an overlap between them, if we take A and B, which is um, sort of this intersection, and we divide out B, or we divide it by B, it's going to be the probability that A happened, given that our sample space now is kind of B. Hopefully that makes some sort of sense. I feel like it might be a bit confusing, but I think more examples will make it clearer. So, there's this definition of conditional probability, which is for events A and B in the subset of our overarching sample space. Um, it's basically um, for these events that are in the same probability space, for as long as event B has a probability of greater than zero, the conditional probability of A, given that B has already happened, is basically just this. So one second. Okay, I'm going to sort of say what I said again, but hopefully in a bit, in a way that's more clear. So what the meaning of this is, is again, we can think of that Venn diagram. We're going to confine ourselves to the set of events, or sorry, the set of sample points that happen inside of B, right? Because we want to know the probability of A given that B has already happened. So if B is guaranteed to happen, we want to find that um, intersection with respect to B, if that makes sense. So it's gonna be like that overlap divided by everything that could have happened in B. Hopefully that makes it clear. I'm just sort of saying it in a different way. But yeah, it basically comes out to this equation, which is pretty useful. And if we want to use this to calculate the balls and bins example, um, we calculated the probability 
of um, event. Uh, what is this? Uh, give me one second, actually. Right, so when we calculate the balls and bins example, um, we need to find the probability of the overlap of A and B. And if we remember, event A states that the first bin is empty. Event B states that the second bin is empty. So if it's the case that the first and second bin are empty, then it must mean that all four of our balls landed in the third bin. Because there's a one third chance of a ball landing in the third bin, and that happened four times, that's going to be one over three to the four, which is one over 81. And the probability of B is the same as the probability of A, um, because really the statements are just the same. It's just for event A, we're saying that what is the chance that bin one is empty? And for event B, we're saying what is the chance that bin two is empty? But it's the same probability. So let's look at a card dealing example. So event B is the probability that the first card is an ace. Okay, and event A is the probability that the second card is also an ace. So first off, there are four aces in a deck of 52 cards. Um, this one is pretty straightforward, I, I think. Again, initially there are four aces. If um, event B happens, then that means that one ace must have been removed. And so the number of aces has gone down by one and the total number of cards has gone down by one. So that's why um, given event B, event A will now have this probability, three over 51. And if we sort of just compute this, um, you know, this value would be on top and the probability of B would just be four over uh, 52. So the four over 52 on bottom would cancel out with the four over 52 on top and we'd just be left with three over 51. Okay, nice. So those are some examples. And now we're gonna get into two pretty important equations that we're going to use to derive just about everything else in this note. So let's see, what is prior probability? I don't know why I just have that there. Okay. Oh, because in context, in this case, we're saying that given B, what is the probability of A? So that's like, given something has happened, you know, what is the posterior probability of A? But this is saying, this is prior probability with, with respect to A, because B hasn't happened yet. So in this case, it's like, we haven't considered B, so this is prior to B. In this case, we are considering B, so this is posterior to B. And when I say this, I'm referring to the probability of A. Okay, so let's look at the medical issue example. So there's this um, pharmacy company that's testing a new drug for some um, medical issue. And the problem description states that when the drug is applied to an affected person, the test comes up positive in 90% of cases and it comes up negative in 10%. So these 10% are called false negatives. Um, I always get this mixed up for some reason, false negatives and um, true positives and stuff. But anyways, it's false negatives because um, this person is affected, but the test comes out negative. So that's, that's a false negative. And when the drug is applied to a healthy person, the test comes up negative 80% of the time, which it should, and positive 20% of the time, which it shouldn't. So that's why this is a false positive. Okay, and we're gonna have two events, A and B, much like the rest of our examples. And event A is the probability that a random person is affected. Event B is going to be the probability that a random person tests positive, okay? So first off, the probability of event A is 0.05% of the population. And the probability that a random person is affected, or given that a random person is affected, the probability that they test positive is 90%, uh, just as we've established up here. 
and the probability that a random or the what is this the probability that a random person is not affected um, sorry let me just say this in order so given the probability that the person is healthy the probability that they test positive is 20% just as indicated here okay so let's see we're going to calculate kind of like the overarching probability so a given b is equal to this which is equivalent to this um, and basically we know that a given b takes this form so we can look at p uh, the probability of b given a and we'll see that it takes this form so basically just substituting the probability of a intersection b with um, probability of b given a times probability of a that's basically what we're just throwing up on the top there so that's how they're algebraically equivalent and this is called Bayes rule and I think this form specifically the rightmost side and it's useful when we want to calculate the probability probability of a given B but we only have um, the probability of B given a so when we have it flipped like that okay so now we have this equation right here right so this is useful because you know this is kind of what we have right that's what we're given and now we're going to calculate the probability of B so let's look at what the probability of B is so what do we have so yeah this area so there's B right a union B is the set that's where a and B like overlap right a union not B is just going to be B essentially or, or sorry that's not a union B that's what I meant to say and the probability of B in this case is going to be equal to you know this part right here between a and B and then the rest of B so if we sort of change what we have here into the um, using the equations we have there the probability of a intersect B is equal to um, probability of B given A times probability of A and we sort of do the same thing for probability of A converse intersect B and um, let's see this is sort of a basic definition the probability of an event A is some probability right but the probability of its converse is 1 minus the probability of A so I think we sort of went over this in the previous note. And this rule right here is called the total probability rule. So it's useful if we know the probability of A and A converse. So this example, it serves to bridge these two equations together, the Bayes rule, Bayes rule and the total probability rule. So now we can calculate the probability of um, given that a random person tests positive what is the likelihood that that person is effective or affected has the disease so we can sort of put everything together into this equation so let's see the probability of a given b is equal to this this rightmost equation here and then all we needed to do was solve for the probability of b right which we got here and so we throw all of this onto the bottom okay so it's just a little bit of algebra um, conceptually it's not too bad it's just keeping track of this can be a bit of a pain and let's see the probability of a is the unconditional probability of event a that is true what is event a exactly yeah, so this is not dependent on anything. We're just saying if someone is affected, we're not trying to see if that is with, in relation to whether or not they've had the drug. 
but then we also have this thing called noisiness which they mentioned briefly i feel like it's some sort of like machine learning topic probably and that's sort of why they squeezed it in here but they don't really reference it at any point um, other than here in the note so what they're saying is noisiness is the probability of b given a and the probability of b given a converse and if something was noiseless then it would basically just mean that the probability of b given a is 100 percent and the probability of b given not a is zero percent okay so now we're going to move on to Bayes rules and the in total probability okay so let's look at some examples let's start with a tennis match or problem framed around the tennis match so the probability of a given event b of x so we're going to say that's 70 percent so we're going to have these two people person x and person y and I believe A is the probability that you win, and if you're up against person X, you have a 70% chance of winning. If you're up against Y, you have a 30% chance of winning. And the actual probability of you being pitted against each person is as follows. So for person X, you have a 0.6 chance of encountering them, person Y, a 40% chance of encountering them. So we're going to use total probability to figure this out. So let's see, we have the probability of A given um, person X times B of X. And in this case, X and Y are sort of complements of each other. And so that's why we can use um, total probability here. Um, yeah, one is the converse of another so we just sort of plug in the necessary information and then we can get the result so in total we have a 54 percent chance of winning okay and now we're going to look at another example this time using um, balls and bins so we want to know what is the probability um, given that we choose a white ball what is the probability that it is in bin one? Right, so um, I'm just, so they, they say, they mention a way in which you might think the probability would come out to, but that's wrong, so I'm just not even gonna mention it. Um, basically, I think, so you have a, f is this right? Yeah, so you have a 50% chance of picking either bin. And then inside, once you're confined to that space, you then have an equal likelihood of picking any one ball out of that bin, right? So if we pick bin one, then we have to look at how many balls are in bin one. We see that there are five and they each have an equal likelihood. And we sort of have to split that amongst the 50% because we have a 50% chance of choosing bin one. And so that would mean that each ball has a one tenth probability of being chosen in the grand scheme of things. And so, um, yeah, let's see. So given that the ball is white, so here, here are the probabilities of obtaining white balls and up top is the probability that it is or sorry I don't think I did that right so we use we're gonna use Bayes rule which will give us this um, let me actually double check um, why this is the case right so what this is saying is you know there are a total of two tenths plus one fourth chance of picking a white ball just at all and on top we have the probability of picking a white ball in bin one and so we can sort of intuitively calculate this but if we want a systematic way um, of calculating the probability of picking a white ball from bin one given we pick a white ball 
we're going to have to use Bayes rule. And that's going to require us to get sort of that that flip. The probability we pick, the probability we pick a white ball given that we choose from bin one, and then the probability of each individual event. And from there we can just plug it into the formula, obtain the values, uh, multiply them out, and um, right. So this is basically the bottom of the denominator, and then and and then the top is um, honestly I don't entirely remember. It. We can just scroll up to the formula right here, which would be um, the probability of white ball given bin one, and the probability of bin one. I believe. I think. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to sort of generalize things. So let's see. We're going to um, define a couple things. So the partition of an event. So an event A is partitioned into n, n events such that one event A is equal to some like sub event or like sample point essentially. A1 union A2 union A is all the way through A of n. And all of these sample, or sorry, sub events, that's how I like to call them. I don't think the notes actually describe them as that. But f all of these events that are not the same do not have any overlap between them. They're disjoint. So each outcome of A belongs in exactly one of these n sub events of A. Right. Okay. So if we want to determine the probability of event B, um, we can do that. I think we have to just use Bayes' rule to sort of understand why we get something like this. But what this is saying is the probability of B union each individual sub-event within A. And we just sum up all of those probabilities. And we can see that this is equal to um, this right here. And I, again, I think we just use Bayes' rule to arrive at that. Um, probability of event B is equal to, in this case, it would be, yeah. It's like the probability of event, event B. Is equal to probability of B times probability of A given B. Um, Sorry, I don't know why I'm tweaking right now. Um, I would say look at Bayes' theorem and like put this together. I think it's like sort of intuitive. Um, yeah, the, so like the actual logic behind like why this works is sort of just reliant on the fact that Bayes' theorem works, I guess. So let's take a look at this one. So an individual sub-event i given b is going to be equal to this, which is directly, that is Bayes' theorem. And we can say that the probability of b is equal to this right here. And right, so actually I think this is total probability. Um, let me double check. Yeah, so that's that's right. So this top part right here is total probability. Again, it's the probability of B with the intersection of one sub event. And it's the sum of all of those probabilities. And this is equivalent. We can write this equivalently by using Bayes' rule, Bayes' rule to kind of convert this into this. And then this equation down here is just directly Bayes' rule. And because in order to calculate this probability of B, we have to use the total probability rule, um, we kind of just take this last equation and put it on the bottom there. So really it's just using these two tools to come up with a generalization um, for this. We'll sort of see a more concrete example of what these sub-events like actually are. Um, but yeah, I, 
if it's not clear, I would encourage you to think about where each rule fits into these two images. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the combinations of events. So let's see. Um, I think this is just notation's sake. So this is, again, these are referring to sub events. So this is the probability of, you know, one sub event or with every other sub event. And then this is the probability of one sub event anded with every sub other sub event. Um, yeah, it's, it's like set notation pretty much. So we're going to discuss some type of independent events. Um, let's see what's just regular old independence is. So if two events are just completely independent of each other, you know, like a coin toss, like we described at the beginning, then we can simply multiply their individual probabilities together to figure out the probability of A and B. So we're going to assume that the probability of B is greater than zero using um, Bayes' th rule. We can just simplify it down to the probability of A just alone. Because again, the probability of A given B is still the probability of A because A is not dependent on B. And then clearly the same goes for probability of B given A. Okay, so yeah, coins and dice are good examples of this, of just strict independence. Now we have mutual independence. So this one is a bit more interesting actually. So again, we're gonna have some subsets of some actual event. So these subsets are going to be just A1 through AN. And these subsets are just going to, or we're gonna have an index set to just keep track of all of them. We're gonna say that the size of this set is greater than or equal to two. And essentially the probability of any subset ended with another is just going to be the probability of any one sub event multiplied by another. Okay, and um, let me see, what was the difference here? I think, I don't know if this is right, I might have to double check that. Right, there just needed to be um, an overline there, or that's the latex, it's really the converse. So there's a spider on the wall, that's okay. Okay. What these two things are saying the same thing. This one is just saying that given some event B of I, which is either A of I or the converse, if we take the kind of like the intersection of all of those, we're still going to get this um, mutual independence. So just any combination of events are just independent with one another. So let's see, something we want to be careful about is the distinction between mutual independence where every event has zero overlap with one another and pairwise independence or there might be multiple levels, but uh, yeah, pairwise independence. So let's see what this says. So, you know, for one through N, the indices one through N we're going to say that the probability of, uh, let's see, sub event J, um, let's see, let's go to the probability of R. So I think what this is saying is that if the probability of one event is Oh, okay, yeah, this is, so it's excluding, it's excluding I here. So, event I, let me just get this straight. I, like, I feel like I'm pretty close, but like, come on. Oh, okay, sorry, so, um, the difference between mutual independence and this pairwise independence is that any event, any sub-event 
in some overarching event where each sub-event is mutually independent from one another means that any combination of those sub-events, you know, two sub-events, three sub-events, four sub-events, all of those will have, you know, probabilities in which we could just sort of like multiply them together because one event does not influence another. Now what this is saying is that all pairs of events are independent. But if we were to have, say, three events together, it might be the case that one is dependent on another. And so we're going to actually look at an example to get a better grasp on this. So we have these three events, A, B, and C. Event A states that on our first coin toss, we land on a head. B states that on the second coin toss, we land on a tail. And C states that both coin tosses yield the same result. Okay, so we're instructed to just check all independences. So first off, let's check A and B. If the first coin toss lands on heads, um, and we want the event of the second coin toss to land on tails, you know, those are clearly independent of each other. Um, it's just like a 50% chance for the first event, 50% chance for the second event. Now for, let's take event A and event C. So if we say that both coin tosses yielded the same result, um, for event A, we're just kind of saying we want the probability that we get ahead, right? And then this is saying that both yield the same result. So. For C, it's still like, uh, what is it? It's still a one-fourth chance, right? Because we need heads, heads, or tails, tails. So A doesn't affect C, and C doesn't really, C doesn't affect A. And then B and C also don't affect each other. So hopefully you can see why these pairs are independent from each other. But when we put them all together, we see that there isn't um, mutual independence. Right, so um, why isn't there a mutual independence? If A and B are given, then C automatically has a 0% chance. That's why there isn't a dependence across all of them, right? Also, I like tweak this example slightly from the notes. I think in the notes it's like heads and heads, but you know, the same chances pretty much still hold up except for when we try to calculate C given A and B. All right, so now we're going to move on to the intersections of events. So let's look at something called the product rule. So let's see. Yeah, we're given this. That's just from Bayes rule. And we want to prove this. So what this is saying is that the probability of the, I think it's intersection of each sub event is the probability of one sub event times the second sub event given the first event times the third event given the intersection of the first and second event and so on. So let's see, how are we gonna do this base case? Um, if n is equal to 1, then we just have the probability of one sub-event, which is trivially itself, the probability of that sub-event. And we're going to induct on something that looks like this, which kind of makes our actual induction pretty straightforward. So we're just going to take this and like put an n minus 1 in front of it. And um, we're basically set for this structure right here. And so what we need to do is calculate, uh, let's see, essentially this, or the n plus one step, right? And so if we do that, um, yeah, so this is given, right? This is given. Now we want to calculate if n is one, like this term is one greater than it currently is. And so if we just apply um, what is it? 
I think it's just the it's just like the first one of the first rules. Um you basically sort of just has have to realize that this is just the intersection of a of n, the probability of events, uh, sub-event a of n, and everything that happened before it, right? And so we can use Bayes' rule now to take this term and then put it into these terms. And then we already know what this is, so we can sort of just expand it out. Right, so... Yeah, I mean, so... Actually, this is... This is just the left-hand side right here is just kind of rewriting what we have here, right? Because for this, you're essentially just taking each term and then applying this curved thing to it, this intersection thing. But here, we're just kind of like extracting out the A of N, and then we're applying that to the rest of everything, right? And so we get this form, which is the exact same thing as this. Okay, you can see, I hope you can see my mouse. But anyways, to look at a simple example of this, um, coins are nice because of their mutual independence. So the probability of event A in this case is going to be, we're just going to use the product rule. And so say um, we want to know the probability of that three coin tosses are all heads. We're gonna take the probability um, that the first one is heads the probability that the second one is heads, given that the first one is heads, multiply that by the probability that the third one is heads, given that the first two are heads. Hopefully that makes intuitive sense. Um, luckily for us, because these are all mutually independent, these just kind of reduce down to the probability of those individual events. And so in this case, it's just one half raised to the third. So, yep, pretty much what we said. Now we're going to look at the Monty Hall example. So recall from the last video that uh, we are contestant on a game show. There are three doors. Behind two of them are goats. Behind one of them is a prize. We get to pick one door and obviously we want the prize. And after we pick one door, this lady, na this lady named Carol is going to open a door that has a goat behind it. Um, she will always do this and she can always do this because there are two goats behind, you know, two doors. Whereas there's one goat behind two doors, right? Hopefully you remember this. So let's kind of take a look at the probabilities now. So if we remember there's two cases, um, right? We're going to look at the case in which the prize is behind a different door than the door that the contestant initially picked. So we're going to say that the probability that the contestant picks door one and the probability that the prize is behind door two and the probability that the host picks door three is equal to this. So in this case, we know that the host must pick door three, and so that's why we have one here for you know the contestant. The contestant has no idea where the prize is, so they're just sort of randomly picking. And similarly, the prize could be could be behind any one of three doors, and that's something we described last note. This is putting it in terms of the product rule, and um, yeah. So notice how these two events are independent of each other. So, you know, the contestant could pick any door, the prize can be behind any door, but given that the contestant picked a door one and the prize is behind a door two, that must mean that the host must pick the only other door left with a goat behind it. And so this is the conditional part. These events are sort of exclusive and we wouldn't have been able to calculate this if we didn't use conditional probability because um, host picking three is a one-third chance. Um, 
I think I knew at one point, but honestly, I don't really remember. I think it has something to do with the goats could... I think it's like, she would have to pick... So in this situation, in this setup, um, the prize is in one door, the contestant has picked another door, and the host must pick a goat, right? But given that we don't know like where the contestant picked or the prize picked because we are just assuming independence, then the door with a goat behind it could be any door, I think. Honestly, don't think about this too much, I would say, because I don't even know if that explanation is correct. But we're going to now look at the other scenario, which is where we let contestant pick door one, the prize is behind door one, and the host picks door three. So this essentially comes out, or let's see, the probability that the host picks door three, given that the prize is behind door one, or sorry, given that the contestant picks door one is one half. Um, let's see. Right, okay. And from there, we sort of just kind of use Bayes' rules to manipulate this and get this probability. And then we have the probability that the prize is behind door two, given that the candidate picked door one and the host picked door three. And this is what we have on top. This is what we have on bottom, and this is pretty much what we put together. So the last equation, use the total probability rule. Okay, honestly, I should be explaining this, but... Um, I'm just sort of relying on the fact that like you can look at those equations and like put them together. Like I understood this, like I did understand this a couple hours ago. Don't entirely remember what I understood now, but I think that's okay. So we're gonna move on to another example. This one is the poker hand example. So we wanna compute the probability of a flush. So a flush is the case in which you obtain a poker hand, which is five cards, where every card in that set of five cards is of the same suite. So it's like all spades, or it's all hearts, it's all diamonds, or something like that. And if we calculate the probability that we get a hearts flush, then we can just multiply that by four for each other suite, right? Um, right, so in this case, we actually see what a sub-event kind of is, or what, I think there's a, what is the actual term for it? A sub i. It's just the probability that the ith card we pick is a heart. Um, yeah. And so we essentially need to perform this five times, right? Because our hand is of size five, and we need to calculate event A. So each sub-event is the act of picking one card. And because we are doing this where, um, in a case where one event is dependent on the event before it, you know, up front, we have a 13 out of 52 chance of picking a heart because there's 13 hearts. And that makes sense because there is a total of four suites. And so if we multiply four by 13, number of suites times the number of cards per suite, then we get the total number of cards in the deck. But anyways, we're sticking to hearts. You know, up front, we have this chance of picking a heart. As soon as we pick a heart, we reduce the size of the deck and the number of hearts. And so both the numerator and denominator decrease by a value of one for each card that you draw. And so this is, I believe, pretty straightforward. I think we already calculated this in a previous note, but this is another way of doing the same thing. We're just using the product rule. It's like we have tools and we get to use them when it suits us, when it's easier or just you know more appropriate. So now we're going to talk about unions of events, which is, um, we talked about mutual independence, right? 
but now we're going to talk about cases in which there might be some sort of dependence between two events. So just I called it the Vegas game. So you pick a number between one and six. The casino rolls three dies, and if any die comes up to your number, then you win. And they're saying that the odds are um, one over six times three or one half. Because um, the logic is just like, you know, each time you have a one six chance of picking any one number. Say your number is four, you have a one six chance of rolling a four. If you do that three times, then oh, you must have a one half chance of, you know, eventually rolling a four. And that kind of makes sense to me intuitively, but as we discussed at the very end of the last uh, video, we can't really rely on the intuitive argument. We have to make sure we do things systematically. So we're going to introduce some notation. So actually, this is something we've already covered. I forget which note we did, but the principle of inclusion-exclusion, um, I didn't go over it in that video, but thanks to my... Um, GSI and a little push from the notes, I'm going to draw out some visualization that will give a better intuition for why this works. Okay, but let's actually discuss what it is. So we want to find out the probability of you know, event A, A1, union event A2, union with um, event AN. And it comes out to this thing, which is basically um, what it's trying to say is that we're going to add the probability of all single events. And then we're going to subtract the probability of all pairs of events, pairs of events, and then add the probability of all triples of events, sort of repeat this process. So add all evens or add all odd sized um, like intersections of events. Subtract all even sides size intersections of events. So in, in this context, in the context of this problem, you know, we have these three events. So first off, we're going to add all of the probabilities of each individual event. And then we're going to subtract out the probability of each overlap and, or sorry, of each pair. And then we're going to add back um, the triple, just kind of like and what we did here. So I feel like notation it was scary. I mean, it used to be scary, but it actually sort of makes, simplifies down what you're saying quite a bit sometimes. It's just like knowing what the actual symbols mean, I think was the hardest part sometimes. But like, this is a pretty, I feel like, um, simple relationship. Now let's actually get an understanding for why it works. So give me one second. Okay, so we switched over to paint. Um, let me see. Right, so the best way of understanding this is by using a Venn diagram, as the notes sort of hinted at. So I'm going to represent probability of event A is that top circle, B is that bo or bottom left circle, and then C is the right circle, right? And what we want to calculate is the probability of A or B or C. And if we think about intuitively what that looks like, it would kind of be like if we had separated all of the circles away from each other. Like if, if this was A and this was B and this was C. We wanted to calculate the probability of A or B or C, but not, you know, any of that overlap. So how do we do that? Well, we take kind of like the combination and then we subtract out the overlap. It's pretty much that simple, but there's a systematic way of doing it, doing that when there is multiple overlap. Like if it's just two, um, for example, this and this, if we say A plus B, we're gonna get this area counted properly and this area counted properly, but this area is going to be double counted. So we're gonna have to subtract out that. And I'm just going to take that away. And we basically apply the same logic just for the case in which there are 
three events. So if we remember, I'm just going to write out the letters. I'm not going to really use the notation. Um, oh, wait. Sorry, my camera was blocking that bottom. Let me just move. No, that is not what I wanted to do here. I'm just going to move myself up. OK, so this is what I was trying to say. What we're trying to calculate is the or of every event. And that's kind of like the probability of each event separately, like that. Um, but hopefully you saw the two event um, representation. So now for three, um, what it was was all of the single events added together. We're going to subtract out all of the pairs of events. Uh, what is it? BC. And then we're going to add back the the triple in this case. So it's just going to be one thing. And let's see if this kind of gives us this pattern, which I guess I could just briefly. Like, this is what we want, right? Just the areas of the circles alone. So we can get the area of A, B, and C, no problem. Now, upon getting the area of A and B, we're going to have this double counted, right? So we're going to need to subtract that out. And then since we got the area of B and C, we're also going to have to subtract out you know, this spot. And then we're going to have to do the same for that. So what happens is that each of these areas gets counted twice, right? So we want to subtract them out once. And then this area gets counted three times. But because we subtracted out this area three times, you know, all of these, this is like one thing right here. This is one thing, and this is one thing. Even though we had initially counted this centerpiece three times, we subtracted out these sets of two three times. So now this is this doesn't exist. And so we have to add it back. So that's kind of like the intuitive understanding for why we do this sort of like alternating um, series of events. OK. So I'm going to switch back. Yeah, I'm going to switch back. And that's pretty much like the last major thing, I think. Um, so applying that to the problem, we get these pro these probabilities, and it turns out to be a 42% chance rather than a 50% chance of you winning. So again, something we talked about is mutual independence, where every event is unaffected by one another. Now we're going to talk about something which is different, which I initially thought was the same. But this thing is called mutually exclusive events. and these are um, two events that cannot have overlap. So let's see. I guess for mutually independent events, you know, flipping a coin multiple times can yield heads multiple times. But upon accomplishing one event, the next event is you know, not dependent on that. But a mutually exclusive event means that like each like sample point, you know, you'll be you'll be drawing a different value out of your overarching sample size. Or at least I think that's what it means. So each like sub event essentially has no overlap with any other sub event. So something we can notice is that if we kind of take the or of all sub events. Um, such that it's the case that there is no overlap between any of these sub-events, then we sum, uh, it would be the equivalent of summing up all of the probabilities of those sub-events. Right, I guess that pretty much makes sense. Again, we have some event A. It is comprised of sub-events A1 through AN. If we sum up events A1 through AN, we're going to get the or sorry, if we sum up the probability of events A1 through AN, we're going to get the probability of A. 
And if it's the case that all of these sub-events don't overlap with each other, then it's going to be exactly equal to the probability of us oring all of these sub-events together. So that's pretty much an example of that was when we did the probability of calculating a flush because, um, let's see, the probability of you ca the probability of you calculating a heart's flush is independent of you calculating like a spades flush is independent of you calculating a diamonds and so on. And union bound is when some of these sub events have some sort of overlap. So you know it could be the case that. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty intuitive, to be honest. Um, they can have any range of overlap. Like, if they have no overlap, then they're going to be um, mutually exclusive, and so they're going to be, again, equal to the sum. If they have a large amount of overlap, then if we OR them, it's going to be a lot less than um, if we were to sum up all of the individual probabilities. So we can treat this, the right-hand side of the equation, as an upper bound for the probability of oring all of those events. All right, that has been a pretty long note. So that concludes note 14. I think this is definitely one of the more important ones that is bridging a lot of ideas together. But even though I had to double check things a lot, I hope I got most of the major points across. So, yep, that has been note 14 of CS70. This has been conditional probability.